Welcome. I'm uh, Dr. Irene Litvin. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of California, San Diego. We are at the 17th International Congress of Movement Disorders in Sydney, and I'm having the pleasure of talking to John Steele, who is the most known movement disorder specialist in WAM, and he has plenty of things to tell us about his life. So first, uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your education. Thank you, Irene. And it's a delight being with you again. We've known one another for so many years now. I'm from Toronto and uh, from a family of physicians in Toronto. And that's where I had my education, a fine education, and where I did medical school, um, finishing that in 1959, and then entering into Dr. Richardson's program for neurological training in, uh, in that year. And uh, com after completing that, then I went on to postgraduate training at Queen Square uh, with Roger Gilliatt and his group and also Dennis Williams and then to Marseille where I studied with Henri Gasteau uh, and so that was my formal education and training in neurology. Uh, I continue to regard myself though I've been away from Toronto for many years as a Torontonian and that's my identification and those are my roots. So, can you tell us about um, what led you to uh, study neurodegenerative diseases? Well, the decision to do neurology uh, was taken, really it began in late medical school and was influenced by people who were my teachers then, particularly Henry Barnett and uh, Dr. Richardson. And then as I began my internship and spent time with them both and also with the neurosurgeons, I decided that I'd prefer doing neurology rather than neurosurgery, which was the option, uh, because of the greater likelihood of advances being ahead in neurology than in neurosurgery. So uh, then I spoke with Dr. Richardson and, uh, and he agreed that I could enter his program at the Toronto General Hospital. Um, I had an interest in neurodegenerative disease that comes from my family. My grandfather developed a dementia. He was a physician in Toronto who developed a dementia when I was still a young person. I remember his change then from an amiable, loving grandfather to rather an irritable, irascible old man. Mm. And then further on, while I was in medical school, my mother developed her dementia. And subsequently, a brother and a sister have died of a dementia with Parkinsonism. So in our family uh, has been this specter and reality of Lewy body disease, mm -hmm. which I've been aware of since early childhood and felt rather threatened by. And neurology seemed an opportunity to get at not only our family disease, but other diseases that carry the specter of dementia with them. So that's a background. And perhaps, I'm sure indirectly, it. Uh, influenced my decision to choose neurology. Mm 
as I said earlier, as a, an opportunity to solve problems and make advances in understanding that neurosurgery, the career in neurosurgery, would not have allowed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, who would you say were your heroes, your role models in the field? Well, of course, my family, my grandfather, a general physician in Toronto, my father, a general physician, a family practitioner in Orillia. Mm -hmm. I remember their offices quite clearly, the patients visiting, my encouragement to be part of their lives. My uncle, who was a remarkable physiologist, who discovered and described calcitonin and was the uh, head of uh, physiology at uh, the University of British Columbia for many years. Very distinguished career. So those were all the early people of my life who influenced my decision to enter medicine. I mean, I, I was the eldest son, so I had no choice. <laughs> to become a doctor. That was a family expectation. And I met it, and I met it very well. I know that. Yes. In fact, this kind of brings up, um, what would you consider that are your major achievements in the field? Well, of course, the best known achievement uh, is the description of progressive supranuclear palsy with Drs. Richardson and Olszewski. That was a project we began when I worked with Professor Olszewski, learning neuropathology, and at the same time describing cases that Dr. Richardson had recognized and identified years earlier, uh, patients who had a very distinctive clinical illness that he recognized as being quite unique and not clearly defined before. And uh, during, we, we began our studies with Dr. Olszewski in 1962. And we agreed at the outset that we'd describe the pathology of these cases Richardson had identified. And uh, we did so. Long hours, hard work, and we agreed at the outset that we'd have the description ready for presentations in 1963 at the American Neurological Association and the Association of Neuropathologists and the Canadian Neurological Association. And we achieved that. And we each made presentations to our respective organizations. Dr. Richardson's was the first presentation and it was uh, received with, with uh, great enthusiasm and uh, admiration by all the members of the Neurological Association. Uh, the same was the situation with Dr. Olszewski. And I was a young person, but at the Canadian Neurological Society, people had heard of this new observation and they were very pleased, uh, and, I, and I, of course, was, was honored to, to give my own presentation. So that was achieved in 1963, and then in 1964, uh, we finished off. The, uh, the article, which was published in the Archives of Neurology, and uh, appeared in the spring of uh, 1964. And so that, that certainly has been my early achievement. But my subsequent achievement has to do with a rather long time spent in Guam, trying to understand this remarkable illness that occurs there that we first learned of, that I first learned of from Dr. Asao Hirano uh, 
1963 when he came to join us in Toronto as we were describing the disease, bringing with him slides from uh, Guam, which showed that the disease in the two places, in Toronto and in Guam, were almost identical. And they were very similar to the pathology of post-encephalitic Parkinsonism. So from that time, I'd known about Guam. But it wasn't until 19, the early 1980s that I went to Guam as a neurology consultant to the Navy Hospital there and became aware firsthand of this disorder. One of my early patients was a Chamorro of Guam who had just returned from the United States having left Guam 30 years before. And he returned to Guam with symptoms of dementia and problems with movement that had begun just a few months before he came back. And during the next one and a half years, I was so interested to follow him and to see the evolution of his illness, which was that of progressive supranuclear palsy, Richardson's syndrome, uh, all occurring 30 years after he'd left the island where the disease must have begun, and having the same features, the same clinical features as, uh, as PSP. The pathology was studied by Dr. Catherine Bergeron and also by Dr. Tomonaga. And uh, it was their consensus that his illness was due to the uh, Parkinsonism dementia complex of Guam. So at that point, I realized that this disease of Guam could provide understanding not only of PSP, but other related disorders, which also occur as phenotypes in that disease. So it was then that I was seized with the passion to investigate this disease. And indeed, that's what I've spent the last 30 years doing and what I continue to do um, with great pleasure and as a great scientific adventure, which I feel so fortunate to have had out there in those beautiful islands with their wonderful people. So um, you've been there for how long? Well, I went to Micronesia in 1972, is that correct? 72, 40 years ago. And for the first 10 years of my very different life in Micronesia with the University of uh, Hawaii, I helped to organize a new health service for that vast area a new health service that would provide care, appropriate care, for the indigenous people of Micronesia, which live on scattered islands, scattered islands over a vast Pacific Ocean the size of the United States. So it was logistically a big problem. I mean, there were archipelagos that constitute the uh, that constitute Micronesia. Um, it had been a trust territory given to the United States to administer during the war and uh, it was taken on by the Department of the Interior and they were anxious to establish the same services to the Pacific people that uh, occur in the United States. So they recruited a core group of people like myself who could be both role models and teachers of the local healthcare staff. So that was an exciting, very exciting, and very different career than uh, 
what I was on before. It was a delight, a total delight. And it allowed sort of the experience of general practice and caring directly for people, which was really why I'd entered medicine. I hadn't entered medicine to be a super specialist. I'd entered medicine to be like my grandfather and my father, to care for people in a first-hand way. And that was an opportunity in Micronesia to provide that kind of care. Our resources were very limited. The logistical problems were severe. And, uh, and it was very, a very different experience of medicine than what I'd come from in my academic life that preceded it. But it was filled with satisfaction. It also gave me the chance to continue to be a neurologist, though at a much lower or much less academic level than before. And so I was able during those 10 years to travel around the trust territory and to visit the many districts that constitute it and to provide neurological consultations uh, to people uh, in, the, in the area. So it was a combination of being a general doctor with all the satisfactions that go with that and continuing my interest in neurology. Then that, we did that for, or I did that for 10 years then uh, I was offered the opportunity to go to Guam to begin a veterans clinic there for Chamorros who'd served in the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and also to be the neurological consultation at the Navy Hospital. And that seemed a perfect, uh, that seemed a, a perfect job and so it was. So that's how I began and Though Carlton Gadrasek had just written that the disease on Guam had disappeared and was rapidly disappearing, what I found, in my experience, was that it remained quite common. And so with Dr. Bruce Schoenberg, who was heading the, institute, uh, the, the uh, Neurological Institute at NIH then, and who had responsibility for Guam, uh, we met, liked one another. He was interested by my observations. And though NINDS wanted to leave the place because they, Carlton had provided an explanation, a hypothesis for its cause, and it was known to be declining, Murray Goldstein, the director, wanted to leave. Uh, and Bruce was given the responsibility for leaving. But we agreed together we needed to continue. And so we did. And uh, I began to follow the group that was left over when the formal study was ended in 1982. So that provided me with a large number of patients to become familiar with, and to continue a longitudinal study about. Subsequently, the NIA, because of the dementia, which was an increasing, was increasingly prominent as a late manifestation of ALS PDC, they took an interest in the disease. And so they funded a resurrection of studies on Guam which were led by Dr. Leonard Curlin, who was about to retire from uh, his position at Mayo Clinic. And of course, that was a delight to Leonard because he was one of the early investigators that had been interested in the disease and had promoted the, uh, the, the establishment of a research center there in the 1950s. So then during the next 18 years, the NIA conducted studies initially together with the Mayo Clinic, and subsequent to that with your institution, the University of uh, San Diego. And their studies then ended in 2008, 
My studies continue and uh, are to be joined by the University of San Francisco and uh, under auspices of the Memory and Aging Clinic, which is headed by Dr. Bruce Miller, and uh, in cooperation with Michael Geshwin and, uh, and uh, Susie Lee. So that's the future. But that's not what you're asking about. Well, actually, uh, yeah, where do you think the future of the field is? And well, I think ALS PDC is one of a number of neurodegenerative diseases. And I think they all share a common mechanism. And I think that mechanism is being revealed now, and that's to me the excitement of neurodegeneration and the excitement of the end of my career. Because I do feel we're going to have an understanding of the cause of these diverse diseases, which probably have a common uh, cause. And the cause, I think, I'm quite convinced about is of infectious proteins. Infectious proteins, prions if you were, if, it, if, if, if you like, that spread slowly through the brain, up or down, a disease with incredibly long latency, variable latency, but often very long, uh, which just simmers along and then erupts. And it may erupt 50, 40 years after in an acute fulminant illness that may progress and be fatal within 6 to 12 months. Um, and as I say, I, I, for me, I see this as being due to a protein, having a protein etiology. And so I think proteins are adding yet another cause of infection, probably one that involves the whole of the body, but is chiefly manifest in the brain. Um, and I think the challenge of this is to know where these abnormal proteins that begin the process come from and how they spread. And maybe with understanding of that, we'll come to know what we can do to influence or regulate them. We don't know that now. Mm -hmm. We don't know so much about so many things. But I think we're now on the right track. <clears throat> and I think the years ahead will be very exciting ones as we learn more about these proteins and how to regulate them, which hopefully will give rise to cure. The reason Guam is so important now is because the disease is ending there. It's ending there in a way that the other diseases, the other related diseases, are not altering, so far as we know. But in Guam, we're quite certain, because of the careful studies, longitudinal studies by NIH over, since 1957, more than 50 years, we know by those careful studies that the decline began in the mid-1950s and has steadily continued so that ALS has disappeared, Parkinsonism is not no longer common, and the only phenotype which remains is dementia, which is of an Alzheimer's type and which we refer to as Mariana's dementia. Mm. And by example, in the small village of Umatic, a village discovered by Magellan in 1521, which is the epicenter of this disease on Guam. At the present time, there are only 18 people we identify 
with this disease. They all suffer dementia. Some have elements of Parkinsonism, but that's not dominant. It's predominantly a dementia. Of older people, older than 60, uh, and uh, no one in the village has ALS, nor has anyone been affected in the village with ALS for many years. So with US San Francisco, we hope to characterize the dementia of, that, of those residents very carefully and to study their neuropathology, making sure we have autopsies of each person that's uh, studied. And at the same time, we'll look at the genetics by blood studies from people of the village uh, to make sure there is not a genetic component. I don't think genetics can be very important because genetic diseases don't decline mm -hmm. over 50 years from 400 times the rates elsewhere to zero. Mm -hmm. And I also know that the disease uh, occurs in non-Chamorro migrants to Guam who've come to live there uh, before 1957. So we know of Filipinos and Caucasians, not many, but a few and important ones, who've had, who've had studies and who have pathologically proven disease. And the most interesting observation is among US servicemen who were on Guam at the end of the war, towards the end of the war. And studies in New York City 40 years later showed a significant number to have developed ALS. And uh, yet their exposures on the island of Guam were only for one to two months. And so their disease must have been contracted in that short period of time. And uh, their symptoms, however, were delayed in occurrence for 35 to 40 years. Now, isn't that remarkable? It is remarkable. Yes. It is remarkable. So do you think that there have been some practices that have changed since then, or there have been something that uh, Oh, I'm sure. I'm quite sure there was an environmental factor responsible for the disease. I don't think the genetics of the people were particularly mm -hmm. important in that. And the environmental factor ended in those born after 1950. Now, what could that have been? Well, that's the puzzle we've all faced since earliest days. But I'm quite certain from my studies and studies by my colleagues that it is not due to neurotoxins of the cycad seed as Len first suggested in the 1950s and Peter Spencer agreed to in the 1980s. No, it's not cycad toxins. They're not toxic enough. And what toxin in small amount could ever cause a progressive fatal illness 30 or 40 years later? Mm -hmm. Highly unlikely. Nor does cycad or its seeds Grow in, uh, grow in Japan, where there's an identical disease to ALS P PDC of Guam. So, cycads, it's not. And another hypothesis that was suggested by Dr. Gadusek, and which was the reason the studies were given up by Murray Goldstein in the uh, 1980s, uh, is the suggestion that they were due to abnormal mineral concentrations in the uh, soils and waters of the island. Well, not the case. Not the case. I mean, it was an interesting thought that he had, Carlton had, feeling that there must be a geochemical cause for 
the same disease occurring in the three different areas of Japan, Guam, and New Guinea. Uh, so good suggestion, but the science and the, uh, and the measurements of the minerals and the metals by his group were very flawed, and they weren't confirmed by others. So that hypothesis didn't. And we've spoken a little bit about the genetic hypothesis, which many have favored. Uh, again, the results of that are mixed. Some find no change. Others find novel mutants. And uh, a good friend, Matt Ferrer, is now in the process of looking at this issue again at the University of British Columbia. And uh, with the University of San Francisco, we'll look yet again at the residents of Umatic during the next year. And those will be studies done by Drs. Geshwin and uh, Coppola in uh, Los Angeles. So we'll be more certain of the uh, genetic uh, accompaniment, if there is one, uh, at the end of those studies. But at the present time, there's no other explanation. There is, however, a very important marker of this disease, which is unique to Guam and to the key peninsula of Japan. And that's a linear retinopathy mm -hmm. that occurs at the backs of the eyes and can be identified just by binocular um, ophthalmoscopy. That was a type of visualization of the optic fundi that the NIH neurologists working on Guam never performed. They always used the direct ophthalmoscope to examine the fundi. So they never saw this most remarkable accompaniment. We call it the linear, we, what do we call it? We call it linear retinal pigment epitheliopathy, LRPE, the little bit long. But it does have the appearance of a parasite migration, but it's asymptomatic, it never progresses. Once established, you can look 10 years later, 20 years later, the same. So it's a static retinopathy. And what we know is that it often precedes the onset of the neurological disease. So we think of it as a marker preceding this disease and telling us that this disease lies ahead if people live long enough. Now, as I say, it's asymptomatic and non-progressive. Uh, people don't recall any incident. A parasite has never been seen, but it wasn't looked for before. So it could have there could have been parasites there, but because they weren't giving rise to symptoms, people didn't come to see the doctors to see what was going on in their eyes. Now, that's a puzzle. I think, and I've thought for many years, since the late 1980s, when ophthalmologist Terry Cox discovered it, quite by chance, among patients who we refer to the UBC. He discovered it quite incidentally when he was examining their fundi and during the course of assessing the gaze palsy, which was the reason we'd asked a neuro-ophthalmologist to see these patients. So since he described that in the 1980s, we've uh, identified more than 350 patients with the retinopathy. And we've searched the literature and we've talked to the foremost of ophthalmologists and uh, uh, ophthalmologists and parasitologists uh, to see what this could have been. And none of these foremost authorities have seen anything like this anywhere else in the world. And it's uh, 
and, and they can't tell us what the organism might have been if it was an organism. And everyone agrees it has that appearance. So that's, a, that's an unsolved mystery, and it, but an important one. Mm -hmm. And it's um, as great a mystery as the certainty of the cause of the neurological disease. But clearly the two are going together, you know? Well, thank you so much, John, for sharing this fascinating history of yours as well as that of the study of um, PSB as well as BDC and understanding better, hopefully soon, uh, what the causes of these neurodegenerative diseases are. So I thank you for your time and I thank you for your wonderful comments. You've been, you've been a wonderful interviewer and uh, I think it's so marvelous that the Movement Disorder Society are doing these records as we're beginning now so that towards the future you'll really be able to look back and hear what the opinions were by the experts <laughs> at the time before there was certainty. But I'm sure certainty lies ahead and that's my optimism. And that's been my pleasure to, to make these observations and gain this understanding uh, in the Pacific where I began that romance with its people and its islands 40 years ago, more than, so it's been more than half a lifetime and such a lifetime it's been. Thank you, Irene. You're a good and kind uh, interviewer. Thank you. Thank you so much for your dedication, actually. <laughs>